Hi, and welcome to Five Questions with Jacob Remus. My name is Danielle Hartunian, and I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Relations at the Gallatin School of Individualized Study at NYU. Thank you for joining us for today's conversation, which is made in partnership with the NYU Alumni Association. Before we begin today's session, we just want to say on behalf of all of us at Gallatin and at NYU, we hope you and your loved ones are healthy and safe and taking good care during this uncertain time. We're thankful that you're here today, tuning in from wherever you are or whenever this video finds you, and we hope it helps you stay connected with Gallatin and the NYU community at large. With that, I'm thrilled to introduce you to our feature speaker today, Jacob Remus, Clinical Associate Professor at Gallatin. Professor Remus is a historian of modern North America with a focus on urban disasters, working class organizations, and migration. His book, Disaster Citizenship, Survivors, Solidarity, and Power in the Progressive Era, looks at how individuals, families, and civil society at large responded to the 1914 fire in Salem, Massachusetts, and the 1917 explosion in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Jacob, welcome. Hi there, how are you? I'm great, how are you? I'm good. Oh, your video just went away. Oh, that. Hello, how are you? <laughs> I'm well, how are you? Good. Thanks for being with us today. Um, we're just gonna jump right into our first question. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and your work. How does one come to specialize in disaster studies? Uh, well, so I'm a historian and I was uh, in graduate school uh, studying uh, North American working class history. And my second, my first semester of my second year in graduate school was when Katrina hit. And uh, I was taking a class on, um, on urban history, readings in, in, in North American urban history. And the professor, who is a, a, a very smart woman named Sally Deutsch, uh, said that the first week uh, that she uh, that she expected that all of these stories that we were hearing coming out of New Orleans that week, because that was the week of kind of the, the worst of Katrina, all of those stories about rapes and murder and looting and people running wild in the street, all of that was going to turn out to be not true. And uh, sure enough, it largely was untrue. There were all of these stories about people going crazy in the absence of the state that turned out not to not to happen. And so I, I got really interested in this question of how do people act when the state's not there? How do people act in these moments of sort of suspended normality? And as I did research, I realized that that's actually not the right question, that normality is not that suspended, the state doesn't disappear. Uh, but that then drove my questions about disasters more generally. And then I, I picked these two disasters, the Salem fire and the um, the Halifax explosion, and and went from there, and really discovered uh, just how useful disaster is as a way of understanding society, because because disaster is not times in which uh, normality is suspended or time out of time. They are real disasters are really embedded in their historical moments, and so when we study disasters, we can use them not not just to study this kind of trans historical category of disaster but to think about what does this disaster show us about the society that we're in. Right, and then we're in such an interesting moment to apply that framework right now. Um, but before we do that, let's like debunk <laughs> and get to the basics. Any myths or, or misconceptions when you're talking about this, like what is a disaster versus what isn't a disaster, if that's even something that we could define. Um, and what do you wish people or non-experts knew about it? So, um, so this question of what is a disaster is a really good one. Uh, there's kind of a classical answer, um, or there are a couple of classical answers. One is to think about disasters as large scale or mass emergencies. Another way I like to think about disasters in kind of this classical way is there's a time in which the capacity of society um, is is exceeded. So if you think about like a, a highway, um, there's 
traffic goes on the highway, but then when there are too many people who need to use the highway, there's a traffic jam. And we can think about disaster as kind of a similar thing that in ordinary life, there's only certain, there's only so much capacity of the state, there's only so much capacity of our institution, our, our civil institutions, our civil society, even our families to deal with things as they go wrong. And if it all goes wrong at once, then that's a disaster. Uh, but, I, but I increasingly think that the category of disaster is really a, um, not a great category, that the category of disaster serves to say that some suffering is okay and some suffering is not okay. So uh, to take the, our current disaster, the entire world is uh, essentially shut down uh, and really worried and correctly shut down and correctly worried about, about COVID, about a particular uh, lung infection. Well, there's another lung infection, uh, tuberculosis, which kills about 4,000 people every day. It killed 4,000 people today. It's killed 4,000 people yesterday. It's going to kill 4,000 people tomorrow. And the world does not shut down for that. Uh, most Americans don't even really care or think or know about it. So why are the deaths of people from COVID not okay and the deaths of people from tuberculosis okay? And I think we can, we can as a kind of an analytical perspective, uh, answer that question, not normatively, but we can say like, why do we think this happens? Well, where do people die of, where do people die of tuberculosis? People die of tuberculosis uh, in poor, mostly uh, black skinned countries um, and people die of tuberculosis, poor people die of tuberculosis in the United States and in other places. Uh, whereas um, that is actually that's also true for, for COVID, but it is somewhat less true. Uh, so the, the, the idea of calling something a disaster, and this is, not a, this is not an argument for shrugging off COVID because it doesn't kill as many people as tuberculosis kills. It's an argument for thinking about what does calling something a disaster do? What it does is mobilize resources, it mobilizes sympathy, it mobilizes political action, or at least in theory, it mobilizes political action. And, uh, and so we need to think about why do we call some things disasters and some things not? And I think that is an inherently political calculation or inherently political choice. Uh, there's another, there's also in your question, there's, a, there's another sort of set of things about what are, what are some myths and what are some things like which people would know. And I, there are two really important things that I always start my classes with. One is this phrase that disaster scholars have been saying since the 70s, which is there's no such thing as a natural disaster. That, disaster, that there are hazards, and hazards can come from nature. Hazards can be floods, or they can be storms, or they can be explosions, or they can be um, bombs. And uh, there can also, and, but then certain people are vulnerable to those, to those hazards. And those questions of who is vulnerable, that's a social choice. That's a choice that we all make when we set up our society and when we live in our society, and that's not natural. So there's no, the phrases, there's no such thing as a natural disaster. And the second big misconception, the second big disaster myth that disaster scholars are always going on about is about how in movies, when we see a disaster movie, people go crazy. People start, this is, goes back to the, my Katrina answer before, people start murdering and they start fighting each other and they start um, looting and they start being every man for himself. And that overwhelmingly is not true in disaster. That what happens in disaster is that people are altruistic, they're helpful, they practice mutual aid, they practice solidarity, they start to imagine a better world and start enacting that better world. Uh, and so, and that's normal. That's the normal thing that happens in a disaster. It's not the weird heroic thing that New Yorkers did after Sandy or the strange heroic thing that people in uh, Italy did during COVID. It's, that is what, is standard and to be expected. And, and honestly, it's the people who don't do that, it's the people who don't practice solidarity, who aren't helpful in a disaster, they're the aberrant people. So fascinating. I especially liked what you said about um, the part about capacity. 
because it actually leads right into my next question, which is how does the current global pandemic intersect with your work or the work of disaster studies? How has it impacted the field? Um, what have maybe been the greatest challenges or unexpected surprises of it? So I don't know how it's going to affect the field yet. I think that's a, that's a really interesting question that we'll kind of, we'll try to see. I mean, one answer is that, uh, so the, the corner of disaster studies that I am in is um, what we're trying to, it, it's new, we're trying to call it critical disaster studies. And so a lot of disaster studies is very applied. It's very much about um, how, how can institutions and governments and uh, organizations provide aid when disaster happens or prepare for disaster before it happens. Um, it comes out of a very, uh, it actually, it largely comes out of the, the tradition in the United States of, of planning for nuclear war. Of what do we do when the Russians attack us? What can we expect? What are the, what are the things that we should, be, we should be doing to plan for that? And, um, but in, in critical disaster studies, a lot of us come to it from different corners. So I'm trained as a labor historian. And so one of the sets of questions that I have is, uh, how do people respond? How do people organize uh, during disaster? So those are the questions that I am asking and that I'm paying attention to when it comes to COVID. A another group of people are, are um, people come from STS, from, social, uh, from science and technology studies. So they're asking, how do we know um, like epistemological questions. How do we know about uh, disaster, about, about COVID? How, do, how does medical knowledge get formed? How does uh, epidemiological knowledge get formed? How does that then get translated into the public sphere? Uh, so I think this is going to open up a huge number of new questions. And just as Katrina did for me, I think it's going to inspire a lot of new research from people who did not previously think of themselves as disaster scholars, but who are now living through a disaster and it raises all of these new questions. And so they're, they're eager to start, um, to start thinking about them. So thinking about application and how maybe other scholars might be thinking about this general topic, um, I wonder, you know, you did a disaster studies conference at Gallatin a couple years ago before I was here. Um, and I wonder if you were to do another one after COVID, what are some recurring themes from that conference that would still be applicable or what new uh, topics might you introduce? So I, I really hope actually that, the, that, the, that everything we talked about at the conference would be applicable. We're actually, that conference is being turned into a book and all the papers that were presented at that conference are going to be published uh, by the University of Pennsylvania Press. Um, or knock on wood, hopefully, uh, or knock on wood, hopefully uh, soon. And the, I, we have now, we're actually, my co-editor and I are currently writing a, a couple of new paragraphs for the introduction of the book, in which we say, we don't know when you read this book, future reader, what COVID is going to look like or what the world is going to look like. But we hope that there are questions that these chapters provoke that will apply to uh, that will apply to your analysis of, of COVID. And so uh, some of those are about um, how government operates and the questions of competency and incompetency and technocracy. What is the role of expertise? What is the role of um, kind of traditional big P politics, uh, the sort of politics that happen in Albany or Washington uh, in responding? How do people respond from the ground? So um, how does mutual aid work in a time when people can't physically come together? Uh, how do people understand the multiple layers of disaster, right? So there is um, the layer of disaster that is the, epi the epidemic, but then that is layered on the longstanding disaster that exists in the United States of white supremacy and xenophobia and uh, misogyny and capitalism that that structure the way that this pandemic is being felt in the United States. So um, why is it that the disaster, that this disaster is being felt so much more strongly in black and brown bodies than uh, in white bodies? And partially that is because 
overwhelmingly it is black and brown people in the United States who are, who are forced into jobs that in a pandemic are dangerous. It's also because uh, the structure, the white supremacy of the structure of the United States uh, has created social determinants of health that make uh, black and brown people more likely to have uh, pre-existing conditions that are um, that make them more more vulnerable to COVID. Um, so those sorts of questions are questions I think come out of this, or that can come out of questions from disaster studies that we really need to be asking from uh, asking of this disaster. Uh, and I would just another another just to think about this a little bit more. It's not just the United States as we think about how disaster, how COVID is being experienced in other countries, uh, just to go back to that tuberculosis point, um, in countries where there's a high tuberculosis burden, how does COVID disrupt tuberculosis care? And how does it intersect with uh, the pre-existing health crises, long-term crises that exist uh, in countries with, for instance, high TB burden? Um, and those are all questions. Again, thinking about these layer, the layeredness of, um, of these questions or of these crises is really important. Definitely, I like that way you termed it, the layeredness or the layers of it. Um, you know, because in everything you've talked about from capacity to mobilizing and action to systemic oppression, whether that's within the US or around the globe, there's just such an intricate and rich um, complexity there for us to take away from and think about. Uh, we are nearing the end. So one of my final questions to close us out today is I have to ask, um, in studying disasters, especially during a time like this can get heavy. Um, how do you stay balanced or what do you find comfort in? Are there any social media accounts you follow that you would recommend we check out? Um, and if so, we can post them at the end. So, so I, and those are two different questions. I mean, I think I mean, one answer is I don't stay balanced and I don't stay uh, uh, particularly comfortable. And this is an unbalanced time and an uncomfortable time. Uh, and, I, um, and I think that is, I mean, that is true when I think about um, the people in New York City uh, who are sick or are grieving right now. Uh, and I think about that in terms of NYU, which is um, in a uh, very uh, a time that feels very unbalanced since uh, I'm talking to you at, uh, in the middle of May, being in May, and we don't know what next semester is going to look like. Um, so I, I think, so on one hand, nothing really. I mean, I, I, I've been watching a lot of dumb TV, but um, nothing, nothing particularly makes me balanced or comfortable, and I think that's actually kind of how it should be. I don't. I think that people who are who are balanced and comfortable right now are probably lying to themselves, um, or or so isolated from uh, the reality of what is going along, going around that um, they should look out the window. That, that's a little bit harsher than I than I mean it to be. People can be balanced and comfortable, and balanced and comfortable is important. Um, so so in terms, but in terms of what social media I follow, I'm going to recommend three things. One is. Uh, a list, so I'm on, I'm on Twitter as J-A-C Remus, uh, and I have, I keep a list of essentially all the disaster scholars that I have been able, that I can never find on Twitter. Uh, disaster scholars and a handful of journalists who, who really specialize in disaster. Uh, and so for people who are interested in what disaster scholars are saying about this disaster or any other disaster, I, I always recommend go to that and you'll see in real time what people are talking about. And sometimes they're talking about the disaster. Sometimes they're talking about what they're watching on television. Sometimes they're talking about whatever politics. But um, in aggregate, that's, that is how I see through disaster Twitter. Uh, the other person who, I really, who I've been really relying on recently um, on Twitter uh, and in real life uh, is uh, an epidemiologist at Yale named Greg Gonzalez who is a, a um, he's a longtime uh, HIV AIDS activist. He's a, a veteran of ACT UP. Uh, he's an, epidemi he's a, an epidemiologist and a mathematical modeler. Uh, and he has been, um, he has been tweeting and writing a lot about what both how we have to think about this disaster as embedded in society and also what we need to do to come out of it. 
uh, and he is um, he is he is a font of both his own analysis and also he passes on really good analysis and and information from uh, other epidemiologists, other parts of Epi Twitter. Um, so I would really I really recommend following Greg. Uh, and just the third and the third person actually goes back to your first question about what I do to keep balanced is this. This person who I follow, who tweets under the name Peng Melly, who has nothing to do with with disaster or with, with epidemiology, who is just a delightfully weird Twitter account, weird and beautiful, right? So they post, they have a long running thread over multiple years of pictures of, of really beautiful art baskets um, and kind of weird things and weird ideas and books and and. Um, thoughts. Um, so I, I, uh, they are one of the best, um, the, the one of the kind of lights of Twitter because it's it's such an unusual playing with the medium account. So that is my that is kind of my offering towards non doom and gloom. Uh, Twitter is follow Peng Meli. Also follow the the doom and gloom of of Greg. Thank you so much. I like that. Uh, we need a balance, I guess, to be balanced as much as possible. Uh, we'll post those Twitter handles uh, in the concluding slide at the end of this. Um, but thank you for those suggestions. Um, and thank you for your time today for answering our questions. Uh, we really appreciate your time and your insight. My pleasure. It was really fun to do this. Yeah. Um, and thank you to all you alums who are tuning in from home. We hope you learned something from our conversation today, and we look forward to connecting with you again at another Five Questions With. If you have any questions or want to get in touch with Gallatin Alumni Relations, you can email us at gallatin.alumni at nyu.edu. Thank you so much.